Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 125 of This Week in FCPA for the week ending October 19th, 2018, the Heading Back to the World Series edition. The Boston Red Sox storm into the World Series after defeating the Houston Astros in the American League Championship Series. Will the team with the best record in baseball take the trophy home? Jay and Tom, well, actually Jay, hit the highlights from the Boston's 4-1 to shellacking of Houston. Tom takes his medicine as they look at some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories. But first, a word from our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent, integrity, monitoring, and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 700 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent integrity monitor can help your company improve its ethics and compliance program, visit our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. In this podcast, we take a look at the continued commentary on the Brzezinski memo. We consider the (coughs) Trust Across America 2018 Country Trust Index. Securities and Exchange Commission says you need better controls to stop corporate fishing expeditions. Mike Volkoff channels his inner moody blues in a couple of ways. One, he says that CCOs are riding the seesaw. And then he says that third-party risk management is at the tipping point. We explore both of these. The International Forum on Business Ethical Conduct recently published guidelines for model business courtesies and hospitalities. We take a look at a yank in the SFO, new SFO director, Lisa Ozofsky. We <clears throat> talk about some of the upcoming conferences we're going to attend, my upcoming master class, and a discussion of a new podcast series, Adventure. This is Tom Fox. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA. PA, episode 125 for the week ending October 19th, 2018. They're heading back to the World Series edition. Unfortunately, those who are heading back are not the Houston Astros, but the Boston Red Sox, who are storming into the World Series after defeating the Houston Astros in the ALCS. So I'm sure Jay will opine on the following question. Will the team with the best record in baseball take home the World Series trophy this year? And although uh, the series did finish, for me, there weren't a lot of highlights. So I may ask you to uh, give us your highlights going forward, Jay. Sure. So um, will the team with the best record win? Uh, History says so, except for 1946 when the Red Sox lost to the St. Louis Cardinals in seven. But, um, you know, this... uh, I think what's incredible about this is that uh, if you're Alex Cora and for your birthday present, you get a World Series berth, it's it's pretty wild. And, uh, you know, we've noted before that last year he was A.J. Hinch's bench coast, coach. So I think he learned at the foot of the master. And there's, uh, you know, probably a, a certain kind of uh, – Belichick and Parcells type relationship with the, when the student becomes the master. Uh, I think uh, I love, I didn't love, but I thought it was really uh, kind of ironic uh, Mookie's catch out in the uh, right field stands and how we almost had a Bartman moment. And uh, I think it was pretty just gutsy for the Sox to have lost the first game at home and then won four in a row. So you know, I I don't think they lost ever lost any more than three games in a row in the season. So, uh, well, one of us was happier in Los Angeles. Uh, the other one can still take uh, solace in having a great team. And, you know, uh, I think the nucleus is still there for the Astros for the short term. 
Uh, I would only add that the past year has been a magical year for every Houston Astro fan, living or other. So with that, how about some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories, Jay? Well, we've been talking about this, I think, from last Friday. And uh, although um, Rosenstein didn't want to have a memo, a memo, it appears that Mr. Benkowski didn't mind having a memo. So uh, last week in New York City, he talked about some changes with uh, compliance and monitors. So why don't you give us your thoughts on that, Tom? So there was really a lot of commentary about this memo this week, Jay. And what I wanted to focus on for this podcast is really what it might mean for uh, monitor ships going forward uh, in the compliance space. So uh, I took a look at it, and I think the the changes are really um, continuation, uh, or I see continuity from informal Department of Justice policy. I think they're formalizing it. I think they're formalizing it for transparency. I think they're formalizing it for, frankly, FOIA requests going forward that they recognize that the process by which the department uh, makes the decision to require a monitor and then selects the monitor will have increased scrutiny. So uh, I think, uh, but from the compliance practitioner's perspective, Jay, I found it uh, a welcome piece of information. And it's a welcome piece of information Uh, from the CCO perspective for the following reason. If you find yourself in a FCPA enforcement action, that you now have the metrics uh, and the criteria that the department will use to determine whether or not uh, you will need to have a monitor. So uh, if you want to work towards not having a monitor and having worked in a company that had a monitor ship, I can assure you that uh, you don't want to monitor, um, uh, irrespective and irregardless of the fact that Affiliated Monitors is a sponsor of this podcast, and you're, in fact, Mr. Monitors, uh, there uh, is significant information for the compliance practitioner uh, to use to try to argue to the Department of Justice why you don't need the monitor. So um, some of the factors include whether the corporation has made significant investments in and improvements to its corporate compliance program and internal controls, whether remedial improvements to the compliance program and internal controls have been tested. Uh, One of the things that I think this speaks towards, Jay, is the work that uh, you and affiliated monitors do to help companies get ready for these types of arguments. So having an independent integrity monitor coming in really at the pre-resolution phase, I think uh, that will increase. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, what this will mean for monitor ships going forward. I think if a company really doesn't get it uh, and uh, doesn't implement the changes, uh, remediation, I should say, of their compliance program, and does not have the trust of the Department of Justice, I think we will continue to see monitors. But I think by putting these requirements in writing and these steps in writing, it gives the company who may be in in, an enforcement action and the compliance practitioner really uh, uh, ways to um, uh, move forward. And the memo ends with the following where a corporation's compliance program and controls are demonstrated to be effective and appropriately resourced at the time of resolution, a monitor will not be necessary. That seems to me to indicate that if a company's compliance program and controls are not effective or are not resourced at the time of resolution, a monitor will be necessary. And how you have to, and the key verb in there, key word is the verb demonstrated. So how are you going to demonstrate that to the Department of Justice? I think uh, having uh, every person I've talked to who's ever gone through an enforcement action has said the key is to have develop a, a, a build trust with the department. And that does not start at the end. It's throughout the entire process, self-disclosure. Uh, cooperation during the investigation and remediation. So being able to demonstrate how you have effectively uh, put your compliance program in place and then resourced it is going to be a key component going forward. Now, others, uh, most specifically Matt Kelly, channeling his inner cynical journalist, I may add, (laughs) really um, says this is the Trump administration. So, you know, who knows what it may mean. Um, But, um, 
uh, I, I'm going to take the positive out of it. And, and when the department I found, when the department says something, they're going to do something, they do it. And when they give us information, it's significant. So for every compliance practitioner, I found this to be uh, not only a welcome piece of information, but also from the DOJ perspective, really a continuation of what was going on informally. Uh, we've linked to several other pieces so that people can can read this. But uh, I think every compliance practitioner and CCO needs to read the uh, Binkowski memo. Uh, there's lots of information on there specifically around what you need to do if you find yourself in an enforcement action. Yeah, I, I think um, just to tie it all up, Tom, is, you know, anytime we can have more transparency uh, in terms of what the DOJ expects and what we can do as compliance practitioners, it's a good thing. And the other thing I would kind of pick up on that you mentioned is it's almost just ship it, shifting the timing. So it's going from, you know, I, I think in only one uh, fifth of the last few um, resolutions have used monitors. So instead of having monitors being something that's an onerous penalty, if folks want to demonstrate, as you're saying, their commitment to change the compliance, uh, that opens up the opportunity for having a, pro, a, a proactive uh, ethics and compliance assignment going on, uh, rather assessment, and this would kind of dovetail uh, at the same time as a company was uh, doing its own internal investigation and preparing to self-disclose uh, disclose to the DOJ and SEC. So I think it all wraps up, and it's just going to be a difference in timing, and those companies who are uh, committed to, you know, figuring out what went wrong, they're going to be the folks that will be rewarded without needing to have a monitor. So, Jay, next up, we have an article by Barbara Brooks Kimmel. She runs an outfit called Trust Across America, and she really focuses on a uh, not a unique aspect of the corporate world, but uh, uh, um, one one part of it, and that's trust. Uh, you and I might focus on compliance programs or culture or a variety of other things, but uh, Barbara and her group focus on trust, and she's recently released, or rather Trust Across America, has re recently released a 2018 Country Trust Index. And I found this, uh, as always, very interesting, uh, lots of good data and information, uh, so why don't you tell us about it? Sure. So um, basically, they identified 14 indicators of society trustworthiness, including corruption, competition, reputation, sustainability, economic freedom, health care, women's rights, and that's just to name a few. And they put together this 2018 Country Trust Index, and you will not be surprised to hear that Switzerland wins by a landslide, scoring a 66 and making the top five and 10 of the 14 categories. So with this um, ranking, it's better to have a lower number than a higher number. The U.S. does not make the top 10. Uh, we come in somewhere lower uh, at number 20 with a total score of 369. Uh, the remainder of the top 10 uh, is uh, Norway, Denmark, Canada, Sweden, Finland, Netherlands, Australia and Austria. So it seems to be a, a cold weather country list with the exception of Austria. And um, I know you have the answers there in front of you, Tom, but are you surprised by any of the countries that represent the bottom of the index ranking? Um, no, I guess I'm not. Um, those are countries that we tend to see uh, at or near the bottom 20% of uh, the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. And it really drives home the point that uh, Barbara has ma been making, I think, for, for several years, which is that uh, lack of trust uh, is a key component of uh, corruption and that com companies and countries where there's a lack of trust are really more at risk for corruption. So it's a, a little bit different angle, but I think it's a significant and important angle. Uh, as you and others talk about corporate culture, uh, I think th the trust part is going to become even more important at the most recent Converge 18 summit that uh, your colleague Eric Feldman and I were both at last week. 
we both commented on the our first keynote speech was around institutional justice. And part of institutional justice is that employees trust that uh, senior management not necessarily will do the right thing all the time from the business perspective because mistakes are going to be made, but they'll be treated fairly. And uh, that trust can really help create a great corporate culture. So uh, as always, when uh, Barbara uh, and Trust Across America put out information, I think uh, every compliance practitioner needs to take a look at it. So uh, next up, we have a story, and this might even strike uh, close to home to some of our listeners. If you've ever gotten an email that says, I need your help right away. I'm in a meeting, but I can't speak with you. I need you to go out and get $800 worth of Amazon gift cards and scratch off the cards because I need to pay them. If that's happened to you, this story uh, will resonate. So, Tom, tell us about uh, cyber scams in the SEC. So uh, this is actually uh, really a thing, and it's called business email compromises. And uh, my wife is regularly invited by Saudi princes princes, uh, to join them in sharing the wealth. Um, So uh, this is just another type of email scam. And um, I was at the uh, ACFE Houston chapter uh, uh, annual event this past two days, and there was a presentation uh, precisely on this. Uh, Business email compromises, or what we now uh, you know, those in the ACFE called BECs uh, for everything has an acronym. And this is a real thing. And there's been $5 billion in losses since 2013. Companies have been hit with over $100 millions of dollars. And it's basically, basically yet another email scam. It can be as sophisticated as they told a story at the ACFE conference where uh, uh, two companies were negotiating for a merger. Uh, CEOs were doing it directly in New York. They uh, were not able to or uh, were unsuccessful in their talks. They both left New York on company jets and flew to uh, locations which were not company headquarters. Uh, Later that night, the company, both company CFOs received emails from the CEOs telling them that the deal had gone through and they were instructed to wire transfer hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, in escrow money. Properly uh, uh, email looked good. The CFOs uh, did not check. They did not uh, contact the uh, CEOs on their planes or wherever they were going to, uh, and they wired the money. CEOs went to the office on Monday. CFOs, both CFOs on Tuesday, went to see the CEOs, said, uh, we need to uh, paper up this transaction. And uh, the CEOs, of course, said, what transaction? Um, And it turned out that it was an entire scam. Uh, so uh, we've all, I think, now heard the stories where uh, this is unfortunately rampant. And what the uh, SEC has said is companies need to have better controls around this. But, Jay, I'm not sure this is really a controls issue as much as a training issue. Uh, simply because you get an a email from your CEO doesn't mean you should execute it immediately. Uh, if you have controls around segregation of duties uh, for the wire transfer of monies, uh, that is something that, um, uh, you, meaning you should double check. If you're the CFO, it still means you can have a control around contacting the person directly and ask them, is this instruction correct? Uh, is the money going to an account that's offshore or, or other place that is suspicious? Uh, there, um, uh, Doug uh, Cornelius, writing in his great blog, The Compliance Building, uh, really listed uh, some of the common elements in these emails the need to keep transactions secret from other company employees, time sensitivity, foreign transactions. They're directed at employees not typically involved in the transactions uh, and or who rarely communicate with the uh, executive being spoofed. So uh, there needs to be training. Uh, there needs to be certainly controls, but those controls, I think, are largely in place in terms of, hey, let's check with someone. Uh, simply because I get something from the CEO may not mean that I immediately need to, to jump and do it if I'm being asked to wire money to to a location. Uh, the SEC has not fined any companies uh, for these uh, uh, attacks or being scammed, if that's uh, an even better verb, but they may do so in the future as they have called for uh, better controls around it. And companies, unfortunately, the bad guys are moving to softer targets and companies need to be able to respond. 
Yeah, all, all good points. And then there's a, a similar scam from the vendor perspective, too, that you need to watch out for. Um, we've got a couple pieces that we're going to talk about now from our colleague, uh, Mike Volkov. One is about uh, the balancing act performed by successful compliance officers. And then, Tom, you're going to take a look at some um, recent uh, re benchmarking that was done by Navix. And um, our colleague, Mike, talks about how there really is a very delicate balancing act that one does when you're a chief compliance officer. And uh, at, one, at one point, you're trying to embed and protect the culture of the company. And at the same time, you're trying to ensure compliance with controls. And if you go too far on one side, you potentially sometimes err on neglecting the other. So if a company becomes so involved with doing metrics and focusing time on gifts and meals and entertainments, but lacking, uh, you know, controls uh, on other parts of the company, they may be, uh, you know, sorely wasting their resources. So, you know, Mike is really looking at how do you figure out you know, what is the proper balance and where should you focus your attention? And I think as, you know, we've been talking about conference season, a lot of this is corporate culture and, you know, setting up how a company uh, has institutional justice. So I think this is uh, definitely well within the thinking out there. Tom, why don't you tell us about the tipping point for third party risk management? So where uh, we are at the tipping point, Jay, is that uh, companies, I think everyone understands the risk of third parties, utilizing third parties on the sales side or the supply chain side in an anti-corruption compliance program. However, uh, one of the things that the NAVEX report and Mike highlighted about it was that companies are using the same approach for all third parties, regardless of risk. And that's really not an effective strategy. And over a quarter of companies uh, are doing this. It, it really doesn't meet the legal requirements, and it's certainly not a best practices approach that you need to have a risk ranking for your third parties. And then for those that are truly high risk, move towards a more uh, sophisticated analysis and approach towards those third parties. That's what the Department of Justice wants to see. That's what a best practices compliance program is now. And uh, simply saying that you risk rank, or excuse me, you do due diligence on third parties, uh, I would say that's that's not even table stakes anymore. Uh, that's just to, to open the door to get into the game um, or to have any kind of compliance program. So uh, <clears throat> we've cited to uh, Mike's article in uh, the Ethics and Compliance Matters blog that NAVEX puts out. We've also cited to the full uh, third-party risk management benchmark report issued by um, NAVEX. Uh, the other point is that Mike really emphasized and the NAVEX report emphasized is the technological component of these solutions. Certainly NAVEX uh, it is a seller of those and um, uh, so part of it you know, could be uh, them putting that information out there as, as a marketing exercise. Nevertheless, I think they're absolutely right that the more administrative type components of your third party program, you can uh, automate uh, through a technological solution. You're much better off from the compliance practitioner perspective, allowing you to spend more time on not only the high risks uh, third parties, but the high risk areas of each third party. And uh, finally, as as I continually say, it doesn't matter how good your due diligence program is. It doesn't matter how thorough your due diligence is. It's all about execution, and, and it's after the contract is signed. So how you manage that third-party risk on a go-forward basis is going to be, I think, more important uh, uh, in going forward. So Mike uh, emphasizes, uh, I guess, what may be a theme of this podcast, Jay, which is uh, the evolution and the continued maturity of compliance programs. Frankly, that's what I saw in the Minkowski memo was the department responding to where compliance programs have gone. I think the reason monitorships have gone down is companies wised up and they started remediating thoroughly during the pendency of an investigation so that by the end of the investigation, they could demonstrate their compliance program effectiveness and there was a high degree of trust. I see the same maturity around compliance programs 
on third-party risk management and the NAVX third-party risk management benchmark report for 2018 for me really drives home that message. So um, next up, we have uh, another article from the FCPA blog, and this was written by uh, Kelvin Stroud, who is currently the Director of International Affairs at the Aerospace Industries Association. He also serves as the Executive Secretary for the International Forum on Business Ethics, Ethical Conduct. So uh, in this article, um, Kelvin takes a look at hospitality guidelines for the aerospace and defense industry. And uh, basically, he refers to the 4R rule, which is comply with regulations, be reasonable, be responsible, and keep records. So a lot of this uh, seems to be common sense, but um, back again to what we were just saying, you know, if people are following the letter, letter, letter of law with just gifts and entertainment, uh, you know, you might be spending your time uh, on an exercise that is not really as important as where we have other things that there is a higher level of risk. So I think these four R's make sense, and it uh, continues on with the uh, previous work of the IFBEC. Um, Wrapping things up, Tom's going to tell us about uh, a speech that was given last week by Lisa Ozofsky. She's now the uh, the head of the SFO on the other side of the pond. And I had the uh, good fortune to spend some time with her in San Diego about a year and a half ago at the ABA White Collar Crime. And this is one of her first speeches as head of the SFO. So, Tom, what does she the, see as the future of how the SFO will work both globally and how they might collaborate with other fraud fighters around the world. So, Jay, I think the uh, appointment of Lisa Osofsky as the head of the SFO was extremely interesting. She is a UK born, uh, UK citizen born in the United Kingdom, but grew up in the United States, uh, practiced law in the United States, and was a prosecutor in the United States at the Department of Justice. And so she has worked with. Uh, Bob uh, Mueller, among others, and knows what it takes uh, to prosecute significant fraud cases, uh, which corruption cases are a subset of fraud. So she's had a lot of experience in that. She talked about international cooperation throughout uh, the world to fight the scourge of bribery and corruption. But she also highlighted some of the differences uh, between the uh, UK model and the US model. So for instance, uh, there are no non-prosecution agreements in the United Kingdom. There are deferred prosecution agreements, but they have judicial oversight. And so that means that uh, there's a level of transparency and a level of review in the United Kingdom that we don't see here in the United States. She is also working with other nations, specifically Argentina, Canada, and Australia, to share best practices around DPAs. So it's important that if you are caught up in an international bribery and corruption investigation. You may be subject to multiple uh, jurisdictions and you may be subject to multiple settlements or resolutions. It's going to be a little bit different in the United Kingdom. You need to be aware of that. And uh, But I think by her appointment, we're probably going to see more deferred prosecution agreements in the United Kingdom, but we'll certainly see uh, a very, 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 very high level of cooperation between the United States Department of Justice, no matter who's president, and the serious fraud office going forward. Great recap, Tom. Uh, now we're down to the um, events part of our podcast. What do you and uh, Jonathan Marks have com- com- going on in the coming weeks? So I'm extraordinarily thr- uh, thrilled to have announced another compliance masterclass, which will be held in New York City on, on November 12 and 13, hosted by Jonathan Marks and Baker Tilly, where he's a partner. Uh, we've got, got links to information uh, on it and registration. If people would like a copy of the agenda, they can certainly email me. Um, there is a very interesting NAVEX global event, which is a virtual conference. Uh, that's coming up um, 
I think on November 8th, if I have that date right, uh, we've got registration uh, links to it in the podcast. And uh, why don't you tell us where you are, why you're there, and what you're going to do not only today, but over the next few days, Jay, and as I'm going to join you in part of it. Great. So I'm um, podcasting to you from um, another city that never sleeps, Las Vegas, Nevada, and we are out here for uh, I don't know. It must be either the 17th or 18th Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics, Compliance and Ethics Institute. Uh, this is an opportunity where we can get together with fellow uh, compliance practitioners from not only across the U.S., but across the globe. Uh, each year, this conference tends to be growing by about 20 percent or so. Um, Tom is going to be on a, a panel with uh Matt Ellis and uh, Carlos Ares. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about how uh, in-house compliance practitioners interact with the vendor community and uh, get their, um, you know, ba- basically where do the next solutions come from and what's the best way to have that kind of relationship. Uh, this morning, I'm getting together with uh, some of my other volunteer friends, and we're going to a place called Three Square which is a food bank here in Las Vegas. We've uh, worked with them before, and there's going to be probably somewhere between 50 and 60 of us who are going to get together. We're going to work on a um, uh, basically a a conveyor line, and we're going to put together food for uh, people here in Las Vegas who uh, are starving and hungry. So I find that the uh, volunteer event is always a great way to start off the conference. Uh, Tom, I believe we're going to have an Everything Compliance podcast with – uh, Jonathan Armstrong with Matt Kelly and Mike Volkov. So uh, I'm just looking forward to um, a wonderful three days of catching up with uh, old colleagues and, um, you know, collecting on bets from people whose teams uh, lose the ALCS. So that's what I'm going to be doing the next few days. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you paying off my bet and uh, podcasting with the gang. So I will uh, see you soon. Uh, I guess uh, one last thing, Jay, Uh, do you have any World Series predictions for us? I do. I have um, the Red Sox, and I know this is not going to sit well with um, Adam Turtletop, but I have the Red Sox over the Brewers in five games. Wow. Okay, so for those of you Brewer fans out there, I'm going to tell you that Jay's taking all comers on, so uh, just contact him if you – Want to bet and lose uh, $20 like I did. So, uh, Jay, with that, you want to take us home? Yeah, one more thing, Tom. Um, do you have a new podcast that you came out with this week called uh, Adventures in Compliance? Did you want to give that a little plug? Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, I think everybody listening to this podcast and has read my blog knows I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. I've read uh, all of the short stories. I've read all of the novels. I'm completely immersed in the oeuvre of Sherlock Holmes purloined or not. So I decided to create a podcast series around um, Sherlock Holmes and compliance. I released the first five episodes this week. Uh, I took a look at the story, the adventures of the red circle and communications and compliance, the adventures of Abby Grange and institutional justice, the adventure of the priory school and criminality, uh, the adventures of the six Napoleons and mentoring and compliance. And I conclude with the adventure of the empty house and imagination and compliance. It was a ton of fun for me. I'm going to develop another um, uh, series that I'm going to put out uh, at some point shortly in the future. I really enjoy the podcasting format. It gives me the opportunity to explore two of my favorite subjects, Sherlock Holmes and compliance. Awesome. So on behalf of one of the world's biggest monster and Sherlock Holmes fans, Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist, and myself, Jay Rose, and Mr. Monitor. We'd like to thank you for joining us for episode 125 of This Week in FCPA for the week ending October 19th, the heading back to the World Series edition for me and my Boston Red Sox. Thanks so much for joining you, uh, for joining us, rather, and we look forward to seeing those of you who will be attending the SCCE Compliance and S- Ethics Institute here in Las Vegas. Thanks a lot and be well. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. 
you're going to be out in Las Vegas at the SCCE, please uh, say hello to both Jay and myself. We look forward to talking to you and hearing your thoughts on this podcast. Also, if you're interested in the top compliance training around, please check out my compliance training masterclass, which will be offered in New York on November 12 and 13. I've linked to information on it in the show notes. I hope you'll join us again next week when Jay and I review the week's top ethics and compliance stories. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.